president, uh, President Rivlin. He is obviously the head of state. He is not the chief executive of the country, but he is the head of state. So he is playing a very important role in, the, in these types of ceremonies, welcoming uh, foreign dignitaries, and particularly the United States, the president of the United States, which Israel has a very close relationship with. So. And the president also planning on visiting the Western Wall today, which has had some controversy surrounding that as well, his visit there, and whether or not Benjamin Netanyahu would, would accompany his visit there. Yeah, and of course, like he will you, not be. And you may recall, last week you had the National Security Advisor as well as Sean Spicer. They were both pressed about that and whether or not the Western Wall uh, was considered part of Israel. They both uh, sidestepped that question, mm -hmm. saying it was the most holiest site in Judaism, but did not go so far as saying that uh, the Western Wall was part of uh, Israel, except I mean, for the UN ambassador, Nikki Haley, who came out and, and said, no, in fact, Jerusalem, the Western Wall are part of Israel. And that is obviously... Well, that's a huge, uh, contentious point. Uh, and, that, and that's obviously the sensitivity the of this whole... Israeli you know. conflict as yeah. well. well. Jonathan Swan actually standing by uh, as we've been speaking here, watching uh, Air Force One arrive uh, at Ben Gurion Airport. Jonathan, do we have you still? Yes, we do. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about uh, this peace deal, Jonathan. Of course, President Trump arriving there in, in Israel as we watch uh, everybody awaiting his, his arrival. Uh, what can people expect there? What do you think he could actually get accomplished in his short trip uh, to Israel over the next couple of days? Well, nobody inside the White House thinks that they're going to accomplish anything uh, especially dramatic on this trip. Uh, but what you should see is the Israelis will probably make a few uh, concessions, largely symbolic, to show Trump, uh, Donald Trump that they're serious about uh, a two-state solution. Uh, so you might see some economic initiatives uh, for the Palestinians. The, the perspective inside the White House, what Jared Kushner, who is really leading this uh, peace process uh, in the administration, his view, what he says to colleagues is, I don't know if we can get this done, but it's our job to try. But really, what I'm told is that Donald Trump actually does believe that his, uh, you know, self-conceived uh, genius for deal-making actually can get this done. He believes his view of history is that it's a sort of great man view of history, that all it requires is somebody with the deal-making skills, the personal charisma, the force of personality. That's what's required to solve this uh, intractable conflict. Uh, let people in the foreign policy community are deeply, deeply skeptical that that's uh, correct. And in fact, what Donald Trump has already done, which is quite remarkable, is he's already irritated, I would say angered, some conservative pro-Israel leaders in America by not fulfilling his campaign promise to move the U.S. Embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And the reason he hasn't done that is because he thinks that this is something that he can use in the peace negotiations. Uh, Jonathan, let me ask you a little bit about juxtaposing the images that we see of President Trump uh, overseas uh, engaged in diplomatic activity, being very presidential, and some of the challenges he faces back here at, at home. Is this going to help uh, alleviate some of the pressure that has been building up on this administration domestically here uh, with the FBI directors firing, with some of the investigation involving uh, the Russians' interference in our election, and, and some of the political challenges ahead? Uh, short term, yes. Long term, no. I was uh, had a drink last night with one of Donald Trump's close friends and advisors, and he made the point to me that he said that this is exactly what he needs at the moment, uh, and we're we're seeing the evidence of it now, which is that your television, the screens on MSNBC, Fox, CNN, they're all focused on this trip. They're not focused on the rolling Russia crisis. It gives Donald Trump an opportunity to appear statesmanlike, uh, to be uh, dignified, to make speeches that appear diplomatic. This is stuff that uh, will probably fuel his confidence. But you know what? He's going to come back home and, you know, Comey will testify at some point. This is story's not going away. We've got a special counsel. This story is going on for a long, long, long time. And I can tell you the view uh, from Donald Trump's uh, close advisors is that they need to almost create a box for this crisis in the way that the Clinton administration created a box for the Lewinsky crisis. They need to have a point man to deal with it. Right. And they need to effectively have a really uh, sophisticated legal strategy uh, to combat this. All right, Washington uh, reporter for uh, Axios, Jonathan Swan, good to have you with us this morning. Thank you, Jonathan. Right. I want to bring back uh, Andrea Mitchell now, who's been standing by um, as we watch President Trump's arrival in Tel Aviv. Andrea, you're watching uh, his arrival there. I'm not sure if you can see the images as we see them. Are you seeing them, Andrea? 
I am seeing them now, and it looks as though they have prepared the kind of red carpet celebration. I think they're ramping it up. Uh, to try to at least compete, if they can, with Riyadh, because there's been a lot of dispute, as you know, here in Israel about who would be there. Netanyahu wanted to be there by himself. He didn't want his ministers there. He told the cabinet they couldn't come. They then said, okay, they were supposed to stand in the backdrop. They said, okay, we will not go at all. And then he relented and said that they could come. So we'll have to see how this coalition cabinet arrays itself with a number of the right-wing ministers not even wanting to show up. Uh, as well as some of the other centrist ministers because of Netanyahu's uh, disagreements with them. There's a lot of Israeli politics involved in this, as you can imagine. But this, of course, a very anticipated first trip by President Trump to Israel. And as you were just saying with Jonathan, this really does sublimate all of the political difficulties back home for the time being. Presidents in the past, uh, Richard Nixon most notably, have used foreign trips at key moments to, if nothing else, distract from their problems back home. And that certainly is the case, or could be the case. This is a long-planned long trip, but a lot of other problems have intervened, especially as the president was taking off from Andrews Air Force Base uh, just after liftoff, about 20 minutes to a half hour later, those first reports, damaging reports about the Russia investigation. Hey, Andrew, let me ask you, I, I know you've yes, covered, I, I know, uh, Andrew, you've covered many inaugural president's trips, uh, most of them to either Canada or Mexico. What is the significance, you think, of this administration yep. saying that its first foreign trip was going to be to Saudi Arabia, to Israel, and ultimately to the Vatican? What, what's the underlying message, you think, of President Trump's uh, you know, purpose of, uh, of these destinations? Well, first of all, there are a number of messages, a number of messages going in different directions. The most immediate message, of course, was an insult to Canada and Mexico, our two enormously important trading partners and closest neighbors. Uh, that, an insult to them, uh, not well received, as the president had promised to renegotiate or even cancel NAFTA, the trade agreement for North America. So that was an immediate message. More importantly, at least as far as his diplomacy is concerned, he wanted to send a message that he is aligning himself with the Sunni Arabs against Iran. And that was a very important message in contrast, uh, he hopes, to President Obama, whom they felt in the Arab world uh, really disregarded their interests by going to Cairo, giving an important speech, not following up on it, they feel, and then supporting the ouster of President Mubarak from Israel, aligning himself temporarily with the Muslim Brotherhood uh, before President Sisi came to power, and also of course, uh, making the deal, importantly, with Iran. So that's an important message here. Also, the fact that President Obama went to Cairo and didn't come to Israel at all in that first visit, didn't come until uh, years later in 2013, that is a very important message here to Israel, that Israel is so important. It is the second stop on this Middle East trip and that his alliance with Prime Minister Netanyahu is on a completely different level than uh, the past friction notable friction that we covered for years between Netanyahu and Obama. Andrew, is it typical to have, to have this sort of a rival ceremony for, for a, a U.S. president and also to have the politics surrounding uh, what we've heard so far of this arrival in Israel? This is the biggest arrival that I've seen in Israel for an American president. Uh, it's certainly, the, there was a lot of pomp and circumstance for President Obama, but not at this level. And similarly in Riyadh, of course, the royal welcome was so different than what President Obama received. The king did not go to receive him, in, in fact. And in this case, the king not only went to the airport, but rode in the American limousine, the so-called beast, with President Trump all the way in from the airport. So there were so many aspects of that, that arrival that uh, exceeded anything that American presidents have seen before. Uh, you know, th this, just looking at this arrival and at the context of President Trump's uh, hope for initiative with the Middle East here in Israel, he has very brief meetings with Netanyahu and with Mahmoud Abbas. He does symbolic mm -hmm. visits to the Western Wall, to the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. He'll have a 15 minute visit to the Holocaust uh, Museum, to Yad Vashem. I mean, these are not major negotiations. So I think any expectations for breakthroughs on the Israeli-Palestinian front are way uh, excessive. Uh, so what you're hearing from White House rhetoric about the, the breakthroughs and the, uh, the ease that President Trump